good pitching is, is fine at all times, not just down the stretch. And what's really funny is you hear these guys on TV and they're telling you about all of this great stuff about these different teams and how they can hit and how they can play. And what they don't tell you is that when you get into the playoffs, something like this, you're going to face two or three of the other team's best pitcher. And all of this hitting and stuff ceases. So it's not built around hitting when you get to the playoffs. All pitching. Well, the rest of the season, too. During your day in the 60s and 70s, it was basically win the division, play another team, and then head into the World Series. You know, series, it was a couple. It wasn't the wild card and then the ALCS. And is, the longer, is the longer format the extra round? Do you see that as a? Well, obviously, it's, it's tougher. It's tougher now than it was then. You, you had the best record. And in my opinion, when you have the best record in baseball, you should go into the World Series. But you have two or four teams that are, are just marginal teams during the season, and all of a sudden they can end up being a, a world's champion. And I'm, I'm not sure I buy that. I know fans like it because it lets a lot of their teams into the series, the playoffs and what have you. But uh, I think that the teams in both leagues with the best records ought to be the teams that go into the World Series. So no, I don't like playoffs. Okay. Com let's talk about complete games, because you had 255. And a lot of times, players today, if they're pitching, if they're pitching in this era, they're not even going to get maybe five complete games or 10 complete games. Or actually, the person who um, Brooks, who threw the perfect game that it was his only complete game that he'd ever actually. Uh, yeah. Philip Hummer? Yeah, I think Philip Hummer was his only complete game in his career. So, how do you see the difference in that? Where, how much has the game changed? Where people just aren't going nine or. I know well, the, the the game has changed, but it really hasn't been because uh, the pitchers can't complete ball games. It's just the way they play the game today. They have. Uh, this middle man, and then they have a setup man, and then they have a closer, and they have, they have all these guys that they want to get into the ball game, and they have uh, what do they call it? A uh, quality start. Yes. Yeah, my quality, <laughs> my quality starts when I won, you know, and um, I I just you know they count pitches. I had a game where I threw 194 pitches. <laughs> but I pitched 14 innings, and uh, I had three games in a row where I pitched extra innings. I had 14, I had 11, and I had 10. It was back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back starts. Well, they don't do that today. And could they do it? I think they could, um, but they don't have to. And they don't start off in the minor leagues thinking that they had to complete a ball game. They don't have to complete a ball game. You get into the fifth inning, they're looking – down in the bullpen to see who's going to help. And <laughs> when, when I was coming through back in uh, 1930, <laughs> uh, <laughs> if you didn't pitch a complete ball game, the, the reporters wrote a nasty story about you the next day. This guy can't complete ball games. But, but they don't have to do that today. And I don't think it's the player's fault. It's just the way the game has changed. And if, uh, if, if they decided to go back to where they wanted guys to complete games, then they could do it. But uh, another reason why it may or may not be done is because the Baseball Players Association, um, they like to get more guys in to get paid. And when you can use all of these different guys, that means that you're going to have a bigger roster and you're going to have more guys getting money. So. It, it might be a diff, uh, difficult to go back to those days, but uh, I can't say those days were better, and I can't say that we were better. You know, as we get older, we like to think it was better when we did it, but it was better when we did it. <laughs> <laughs> Going back to, to, to those days, some of the favorite people, some of your favorite teammates, guys you still keep in touch with now? Or? Oh, I keep in touch with uh, a lot of guys. Um, 
And the reason being that we, we do all of these things and you run into so guys everywhere, guys that you played with. Um, uh, Joe Torrey, one of my best friends, I see him all the time. And that's, it's not necessarily because of this. I might just jump on a plane and go somewhere and see him. He tried to get me to go on a trip to uh, Italy just uh, about a month ago. Uh, I thought about it and I thought about my pocketbook and I said, mm, I can't do it. So I didn't go. But I see Tim McCarver all the time. I see Lou Brock all the time. Um, there, there are several guys that you get to see basically because you're doing all this traveling and you run into them at the airport even sometimes. sometimes. So uh, I enjoy that part of it. Now, back in those days, were you, were you just mean to the other team? Or you used to mean those days. You know what I mean? Those days. Well, that wasn't that mean. long ago. You're still mean. I've always been mean. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Actually, um, you know, it's, it's really funny when you, when you get a reputation of whatever it is, good, bad, or what have you. Uh, it stays with you. And, and my reputation came pretty much from, from me being on a mound and wanting to win. And it was pretty that simple. However, um, I was taught right and wrong to respect other people. And it, my, my angriness sometimes go a little farther than being on the field. I, I just, I, I demand respect from people. You don't have to like me, but I do demand respect. And I was taught that as a very young kid. This is a kid back here about his age. I was taught that. Demand respect. Don't take defeat lying down. And so that's pretty much been my, uh, my uh, policy and it's, it's part of my, who I am today. And if there's somebody that doesn't like it, tough. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, Joe Torrey told me something I have to verify with you. He said that there was an all-star game, and he went out to the mound, and you really weren't that friendly to him. No. And he said he went back in, and he talked to one of the other players. He says, well, he only talks to you if you're on his team. And he said, even in the All-Star game? And I said, even in the All-Star game? You know, that, that's funny. I'm, I'm writing some things uh, these days, and I'm, I'm going back through a lot of stuff that, that, uh, that I experienced in, back in the day. And it was just this morning that I was writing about that very thing. Did you rem do you remember that? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Um, just let everyone know. Well, let me tell you about the All-Star game. It, the players on the All-Star game are your teammates for one day. And then the rest of the time, they're going back to trying to be a sniper, you know. And so um, I'm pitching. I Actually, I wasn't pitching. I came in out of the bullpen. I didn't start the game. Uh, the National League got ahead, and we were ahead by one run or two runs. I'm not sure how many. And I had gotten a couple outs on my own. and. Tony Oliva came up, and Joe came out to tell me that Tony Oliva was a low ball hitter, and he liked the ball down and in, and Tony Oliva was a left-hand hitter, and 99% of left-hand hitters like the ball down and in, so Joe wasn't telling me something I didn't know, so I couldn't figure out why he was out there, you know, unless it was just for television. So um, he came out, and he says, Bob. I didn't answer him. Yeah. He says, this guy likes the ball down and in, so uh, don't throw him down and in. I just looked at him. So he went back. First pitch, down and in. He hit a double. That'll show you to come out here. I struck out the next two or three guys. I can't remember. I struck out like two guys in a row. We got rid of the game. The game was over. So we're in the shower. Uh, Joe and I are the last two guys in the shower. There's nobody else in there. And Joe's walking in, you know, and I'm wiping, you know, soap and stuff. And, and Joe says, nice game. And I just looked at him. <laughs> because I remember, he might be trying to set me up. I wasn't paranoid or anything like that, but you never know. And I think that when hitters, are 
super friendly with guys that they have a little bit more confidence in hitting off of him, and there wasn't going to be any of that tonight <laughs> at all. So I didn't say anything to him. So now Joe gets traded to the Cardinals a few years later, and he's hating it. He's hating it. He's going, I'm going to see Gibson. What a jerk he is. You know, and I was a jerk. That's a, that's a given. Um, he came into the clubhouse, and I was the first one over to meet him and welcome him to the ball club. And we've been great friends since. And so he figured it out. He says, ah, oh, maybe that's a facade. <laughs> you know, not really. It was just, you know, I just didn't want to be too friendly with guys on the other team. And uh, I, a perfect example is uh, Orlando Cepeda and Juan Marshall. And I think Juan Marshall was probably the most complete pitcher of my time. He could throw fastballs in and out, two seamers, four seamers. He had a great curveball. Uh, he even had a screwball, and he had perfect control. And by rights, a right-hand pitcher with that kind of stuff, there should not be a right-hand hitter that just owns him. And Orlando Cepeda owned him. And they used to go out to dinner the night before the game and have a couple <laughs> little cocktails together. That wasn't going to happen to me. And so I stayed away. And consequently, uh, Joe hated me, but he loves me now. Uh, you guys are... Uh... Not close. Uh, Cepeda, wasn't he traded for Tory? He was traded for Tory, and that was a strange thing. Um, Bing Devine called me, and he, and he kind of valued my thoughts and things about different players. And he called me in uh, offseason, and he says, uh, Bob, I'm going to trade for uh, Joe Tory. What do you think about him? I said, Joe, he's a, he's a good hitter, really good hitter. I said, he's a so-so catcher. He, he's got a so-so arm. But he gets rid of the ball quickly, so uh, but he, he's pretty effective behind the home plate. He said, would you trade for him? I said, absolutely. And then he traded him for Orlando Cepeda. And I called him back, and I said, Bing, well, I would trade to get Torrey, but not Cepeda. <laughs> What's wrong with you? you know? <laughs> so I, uh, it turned out just fine. Joe was the MVP, and he got it. He drove in 150-some runs, and he hit 363. And the funny thing about him, uh, the next year, he was hitting like 309. And I started to say his hair was falling out, but he didn't have any hair to begin with. And uh, he, was, he was really worried about, about his batting average because the year before, he ended up hitting 363. And I, we went out to a bar and had a... Pepsi, that's what I drank, uh, maybe. And, um, and I said, Joe, why are you worried about your, your batting average? He says, God, he says, I hit so well last year. I said, uh, what, what, by the way, what is your lifetime batting average? He says, uh, 309. I said, what are you hitting? He says, uh, 309. I'm like, <laughs> and from that time on, he stopped worrying about what he was hitting. That's awesome, man. I'm sure it was a, a great moment to see him get in the Hall of Fame. Oh, yeah. I was, I was almost as proud when he got in as when I went in. I just, my family, we were all sitting in Bob Euchre's Bob seats. We were right there, you know, and watching, and that was good. I just think uh, for his, people here tonight, too, is Joe has, a, uh, Joe has a charity safe at home, you know, for children, and every year he has a, a golf outing, and Bob always comes, and a lot of players come, and you know, and just to see how everyone supports each other and the things they do is... I'm a lousy golfer, I don't know. <laughs> but I come. Yeah, so that's... Uh, do you remember how, how vivid is, like, the first time you put on that uniform, like, your first start? How, how vivid is that? And well, what do the, you think about that? Like, looking Yeah, at the first now? time I put the uniform on was, was uh, not, uh, not just putting a uniform on. But I consider the first game in the major leagues is the first time you put the uniform on. You can put it on in spring training and practice and everything. That's not the same. Going into a stadium the first time 
with the major league uniform on and being on a major league team is the first time you put the uniform on. Well, when I, uh, when I did that, it wasn't um, really a memorable <laughs> experience because uh, we were in spring training. I had one hell of a spring. And uh, the manager says, when we go to Los Angeles, uh, you're going to start the second game of the series because you fit so well in spring training. Well, we, we get to Los Angeles, and uh, the first game was played, and I'm, I'm all excited about <coughs> after the game was over, you normally to tell you you're going you're gonna to pitch the second game, and nobody said anything. And then the second game was over, and we get to the third game, and I was wondering if I was going to pitch that game, and the manager called me into the office and said, we're sending you back to the minors. <laughs> so my first experience was not that wonderful, you know. And uh, the best day of my life was when that guy got fired. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny only because I remember interviewing Don Mattingly and saying, what was you know, your best moment? And Don was like just having that uniform on and walking yeah. through Yankee Stadium, and he said, like, that's your best moment because you made it. Yeah, you know? that, that, that's it. You don't know if you're going to win or lose or whatever you have, but you, you walk into there and you say, I'm a major leaguer, and that's, that's just great. And and so then, many, then you have a jerk like that manager that, you know, does <laughs> all those things. And uh, who, was, who was your favorite manager through there? My um, favorite manager was Red Shangnies. Okay. And, uh, and I'll tell you why. Uh, Red Shangnies was a great, well, he's in the Hall of Fame as a baseball player. And he knew the game very well. He let the players play, the ones who knew how to play. He didn't interfere with them. You know, you have to make some moves as a manager. You have to make something. You have to do something. But he knew to leave these guys play. And when he had to make a move, he did. He did not make any unnecessary moves. Uh, he left me in too long, too many times, because I lost like 175 games, and it's all his fault. <laughs> but um, he was my favorite manager because he, was, uh, he understood the game. He understood the players, the mentality of coming and going and winning and losing and knowing how long a, uh, a pitcher had to take to get over it. And he knew that if a guy went 0 for 4, to Life wasn't going to come to an end because there was tomorrow. Uh, when you lose a baseball game as a pitcher, yeah, life comes to an end at that time. Well, at Steiner Sports, we're in the autograph business. One thing is that, yeah. I didn't know that. We are, yeah. That's why we had you in. But you sign your name, Bob Gibson. And I think to people here, a lot of people in this room collect, and we collect. And one of the most beautiful signatures is Mariano and people from your Juan Marichal, Jim, you know, signing your full name. Today, that's something that, that you know you take for granted because a lot of people, it's either an initial or it's a, something like a musician or this and that. But you know, how much pride do you put into your autograph? And I mean, I know it's been the same since. You know, yeah, I don't, I don't go out of my way to make my uh, autograph better right. or, or the same. It's just the way I write. And, and that probably has a lot to do with uh, when I grew up, you know, the, the school I went to. And the, teacher that whacked me on the hand when I didn't write or it didn't write the right way and uh, I it's just the way I write okay. and I didn't you know I think these guys today they're all studying to be doctors you know the doctor over here yeah, they're all studying to be doctors you know but uh, the kids aren't as far as I'm concerned they're not taught to do things the way we were taught now, the right way well I don't know if it's the right way well, but anyway. They, they, they didn't teach them. They don't teach them the same way they taught us. And we learn a lot of things at, uh, at a young age that they don't learn today. And they don't have to because they got a thing that they can pull out of their pocket and look up the answer. You know, what do you call that thing? That telephone. It's yeah, great. It's a computer. It's, it's a yeah. lot of things. Yeah, and um, you don't have to really know the answer to things. We had to learn things as, as a youngster. You don't have to know that today, and I love it. I picked that thing up, and I, I, I need an answer. <laughs> Google, and Google's <laughs> got the answer. Uh, is that good? Mm, I don't know, but that's just the way it is today. I agree. I have one more question, then 
we'll take a few questions from the audience and we'll get a photo with with uh, Bob and uh, where did these people come from? Did they just, are they just walking down the street? Where'd yeah, you get them? Yeah, we pulled them off the street. <laughs> oh. They were, they were on their way somewhere. As far as collecting goes, in, your, in the day when you were playing, is did you ever trade a jersey with another player? Did players ask you for a ball and you give them a ball? Did you take a team ball at the end of the year? Like, did actual collecting anything mean anything to you then? Did you keep? No. No, Did you didn't keep know your about gloves it. or your cleat, you know, so you were basically... Yeah, didn't, didn't know saw, about collecting. So if you saw Bill Russell, you weren't like... No, I got, a, I got a basketball signed by Bill Russell now. <laughs> but right. it just so happens that Bill... I, I used to have a, uh, a celebrity golf tournament to raise funds for charity, and Bill Russell came and he signed the ball, so I didn't give it to them. I kept it. <laughs> <laughs> Good move. <laughs> I have Love the ball. That. 11 championships. Uh, great. Okay, and the audience? Yeah. Yeah, yes, sir. Yeah, so I know that you took, early in your career, before you started playing ball, you played with the Harlem Globetrotters. Yes. So it's kind of twofold um, into that. That was obviously an interesting decision. That I'm sure there's a, a big reason for it. But did you know, going from the Globetrotters, when you went into baseball, did you, could you have predicted your talent and what you would you became? Did you have that, I know you have to have confidence going in that you're good, but did you know that you were going to be the dominant, one of the greatest players of all time? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you don't, you don't know that. Um, actually, I, I went into baseball because uh, I, I was always a basketball player as a youngster. I went to Creighton University with a basketball scholarship. I played baseball, but it was secondary. And um, about halfway through, I got a questionnaire from the uh, Lakers, uh, who at the time were in Minneapolis, not in Los Angeles. And I filled it out, and I was very excited about it. I'm going to play in the NBA. And I never heard from them, period. So it wasn't much of a decision. I said, eh, they don't want me, I'll play baseball. And so that's how that came about. Uh, Biking? Those are George Biking days? No, nah, yeah. I'm, you know, I mean, he probably is a few years older than me, or would be. And uh, yeah, those are the same days. Young man, right here. What pitchers do you like to watch today? Pitchers do I like to watch today? There are a lot of them. But I tell you, I watch the Cardinals all the time, and I don't pay much attention to the Yankees or the <laughs> Mets. And I, uh, I like Walker. We have a pitcher, and you probably don't know him. His name is Bob Walker. I like to watch him. Uh, I like, last night I watched this Arietta. I think he's a pretty doggone good pitcher. Uh, so the Cardinals are going to play the Cubs starting tomorrow. So we have to win two games before we get back to him. Uh, uh, all the way in the back with the Yankee hat. I once saw Don Newcomb pitch both ends of a double header at Emmett's Field. Did you ever do that? No, that's dumb. <laughs> How would you have pitched to Babe Ruth? I didn't have to pitch to him, so I have no idea. I think he probably needed to worry about me a little more than I needed to worry about him. <laughs> okay, right here on the front. How did you feel when they lowered the mound? Did you take it personally? I'm still mad. <laughs> yeah, I think that's silly, and, and I'll tell you why. Is uh, they, you know, I hear a lot of people say it was my fault they lowered the mound. You know, thank you, I, I appreciate that, but it wasn't just me. If you will look back at that year, a lot of pitchers were outstanding. And we had gotten to the point where we perfected our trade and we were good at it. And all of a sudden they decided they don't want us to be good at it. And they lowered the mound by five inches and some of the guys were having problems. I had a better year the next year. The ERA just wasn't as good. But I'm thinking that, uh, I just wonder if I'd still be able to sue them. <laughs> We get some some attention from that uh, in the front right here. Let me mention one more show. Are there other pitchers that you had to face in times where you felt I have to elevate my game even more? Or this guy has the same stuff I do, if not maybe a little better, and I have to 
Well, who had better stuff? Actually, um, ninety percent of the pitchers that I pitched against were the best pitcher on each team. That's the way they paired it up then. So I didn't have to elevate my game for that one particular pitcher. I had to do it pretty much every game. I didn't have, you know, what's really disheartening is to, is to go out there and pitch a ball game and either win one to nothing or lose <coughs> one to nothing or two to one. And then the next day, your team gets 17 runs. <laughs> <laughs> but they weren't, you're not gonna, you're not, Koufax, Marshall, Drysdale, Gaylord Perry, Tom Seaver, you're not going to get 17 runs off them. You're going to get one or two. And unfortunately, I had to pitch against all those guys. So uh, it, it wasn't that I felt that I have to elevate my game a little bit on just one game. I had to do it each time I went out there. Well, and I did just think to that point is back in the 60s and 70s, is they made the games up where you would be facing Seaver. Now it's just it's whoever's, whoever's fought day. If it's I, you know, five, it's funny you say that. You know, uh, Red Shangdis, our manager, would always, you know, face me against one of those guys. And one day I, I was sitting talking to him. I said, Red, you know, for instance, I don't know that it was saying, Ferguson Jenkins, I'm pitching against him on Monday. Why don't you pitch somebody else against Ferguson Jenkins? Pitch me against this next guy. And, you know, uh, then we, maybe we can have, uh, you know, a good series. And he says, well, let me think about that. Uh, he says, you beat Ferguson, we might be able to sweep the series. And I said, yeah, and if he beats me, they might be able to sweep the series. Yeah, yeah I never thought about that. <laughs> but that's the way they did it. And you pitched against Ferguson? Yes, <laughs> all the time. <laughs> Fergie, yeah. Okay, Kofax. we're going to take uh, two more questions, so we'll take one right here. You're talking about your uh, competitiveness. Now, naturally, a professional athlete is competitive, but we're talking about a very strong and intensive competitive in your makeup. Mm -hmm. You don't like to give up a pitch, let alone an out. How do you feel when you see this new phenomenon in baseball called defensive indifference? giving up an entire base, putting a runner into scoring position. Does that uh, bother you as much as it bothers me, the fan? No, maybe you need to talk to somebody. <laughs> <laughs> um, you take your stretch and there's a guy on first base and you throw and he's gonna steal second and he's still second and you're like four or five runs ahead don't care whether he goes down there or not. You know, my idea is to get the guy there. If I get him, he can run all the way to third. He can't score. But uh, no, I don't have a problem with that. I'm sorry you do. Uh, <laughs> uh, right here. Hi. It's an honor to be here with you. Uh, first of all, uh, who were your sports heroes growing up, and what was like the best piece of advice you got when you were like a rookie? Um, unfortunately, well, let's go one by one. Um, you probably don't believe this, and it's hard for you to believe, but we didn't have television when I grew up. It hadn't been invented yet. And uh, I didn't have a lot of sports heroes because I had never seen a lot, I never heard of them. Uh, I'd have to say that the first player that I ever heard a lot about, and naturally I kind of gravitated toward him, was Jackie Robinson. You know, I knew he was a black player, and this was it you know, first time, the whole thing. But I didn't get to see, I never got to see him play. In fact, the first major league game that I saw in person was one that I was in, wow. period. Shocking. Yeah, and I, I heard some uh, long distance, I had it, my brother had a radio with this long antenna on it, and he used to be able to listen to some games from Philadelphia, and I thought Philadelphia was in Europe. I, I had no idea, <laughs> and I used to hear some games there, but. I never got a chance to see that, so it was hard to come up with a hero. Um, you asked me another question. Yeah, what was like the best piece of advice you got when you were like a rookie in the major leagues? Uh, yeah, they didn't give you a lot of advice. Most, of, <laughs> most of the guys wouldn't talk to you, you know, a player. for fear that you were going to take their job. Um, Johnny Keene 
was the was the first manager that I that I liked, and I and I'll tell you why. Uh, Johnny King was my first manager in in uh, professional baseball. He was the Triple A manager in Omaha, Nebraska, and I was I grew up in Omaha. And in fact, I signed in Omaha. I signed Triple A. I never played but one week lower than Triple A. And and Johnny King was my manager then. And when he took over for that guy that I don't I don't like to say his name, uh, he he called me in his office and he says, Bob you're going to be a starter for me every fourth or fifth day. So don't worry about it. You're going to start, win, lose, or draw until you learn how to pitch. You know, I came out of college, and they taught us to throw the ball from here to there. Uh, if you throw it here, you're never going to get a strike. And, and they'd say, you got to get the ball down. And I'd get it down just a little bit, and they'd hit it over the fence against the scoreboard. So I had to learn how to do this, and I had to learn in the major leagues. But Johnny Keene told me I was going to be his starter, come hell or high water, and I got to say he was probably my favorite. Great. Um, I will take you one take last, a one last question. Two, couple more. Um, best player you ever saw that didn't pan out? Disappointing. That didn't pan out. Didn't pan out. A talented player that, for whatever reason, injuries, uh, issues, whatever the case may be, that just had a lot of talent, should have been on his way to the Hall of Fame. I don't know. You know, it, that's really tough to to predict. Uh, for some reason, when people see guys or, or girls, as far as that's concerned, with a lot of talent, they predict they're going to be this and that. And there, it, there takes a lot, of, a lot more than physical ability to be this person that you're talking about. There's, there's a whole bunch of things that need to come together. And if you have one or two of them and don't have all of them, a lot of time it just doesn't work out. But I don't, I don't know that there's a person that I could really point the finger at. We had a, we had a s shortstop. I don't know, what is Dick? Who knows? That shortstop that we traded for Ozzy. Oh, right No, no, we traded Templeton. for Ozzy. Oh, yeah. Templeton. 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 Gary Templeton. Now, if I had to point a finger at somebody, that might be the person. This guy could do everything. But you got to have the temperament. you got to have the will. There has to be a lot of things. You know, there's a lot of things that go into us not uh, succeeding, too. We, we may have something in our background or in our family or whatever it is, and we get so far, and, and that's it. So I don't know that you can really just see. Uh, uh, last question, St. Louis Cardinals. I don't know. Uh, your 68 season is like, it's like the one of the seasons you learn about Since then, you've seen people come close, but coming, not, I wouldn't say matching it, but coming close. Would you say Arietta, excusing for the fact that he was close, <laughs> would you say as close as anybody's come to being on par with, with that uh, game? How many games did Arietta won? He was 22 and 6 with a 1 7. You were 22 and 9 with a 1 Yeah, but well, how many years in a row was that? <laughs> well, how are you gonna how are you gonna compare a guy who's played one year to a guy who played twenty? No, no, this is I think his fifth or sixth year. I'm saying just the, the individual. He's got ten more, <laughs> twelve maybe. You know what? We we have a we have a tendency to to make heroes out of guys who are stars for a day, and absolutely he's got some of the best stuff I've ever seen. But let's wait 10, 12, 15 years and then ask me that question. See if he, stays healthy. he might not even be there, you know. Well, so, so I think you, you really, before you put somebody on a pedestal for a lifetime, you got to at least wait 10 years or so and just see what, see what happens, you know. There's been a lot of flash in the pants. Not that I'm saying he's won, but he certainly, he's got great stuff. And he has the, he's, he might be this guy you're talking about. We expect him to be in the Hall of Fame and, and, and to win 200, 300 ball games, but maybe not. Well, let's have a big hand for Bob Gibson.